Our Zoom deity reminding us. <laughs> mm, hello, everybody. Just so everyone is aware, um, for the people who are on retreat right now, or the people who are not on retreat right now, this this talk is during our normal um, Sunday sitting time. And so there's the invitation to the folks who are um, just who would normally just come to the Sunday sitting have been invited to come join us for the talk. Um, we won't be doing the normal sitting. Uh, talk and question and answer period as we do on, on most Sundays. Um, it'll just be the talk that we're offering for the retreat that's going on right now, the Seeing Security Everywhere. Um, it's been really wonderful to be with this uh, great group of yogis for the last few days, some of which are going to be kind of ending their retreat tonight, um, and then some are going to go on through the week, either as full-time or part-time yogis. So, um, so we'll all keep charging forward in our various ways. Over the um, past few nights, taking an evening stroll through the neighborhood after sunset, um, has been very powerful recently. The There's a little place you can walk up to where you get a really kind of 360 degree view of, um, of the sky, you know, not all the way to the horizon in every direction, but, but pretty far, you know, we have some mountains to the east and to the south and to the north of various sizes, but it's, um, really beautiful right now, right after sunset, uh, Venus is in the west, and it's just been so bright and um, just incredible. And um, in every direction, the so Venus in the west, Scorpio rising in the east with uh, Taurus, the, this red kind of heart of Scorpio there, you know, getting higher so brilliant. Uh, Polaris, or the North Star up in the north, and then here at this time of the year, you can also see the Southern Cross in the south. Um, so beautiful, really um, a lovely constellation that I don't know from, you know, my childhood, but has been a uh, really beautiful thing to get to know since I've lived in Hawaii the last 10 years or so. And so stopping at this point and, you know, walking in the sort of quietude and having this sense of um, alignment, right, of kind of being in the center of, of these very powerful constellations and, and, you know, clear points of light in the cardinal directions. Um, there's this feeling of, um, you know, unification, you know, of um, everything in its place, uh, perfectly put together, um, this coherence and the sense of solidity and unity. Uh, that's really amazing, you know, and very compelling, you know. Um, when we have an experience of ourself and the universe, uh, or you know, the galaxy, the the sort of cosmos around us, um, fitting into something that feels like a kind of alignment, or 
um, kind of, yeah, coming together, unification. Mm, how powerful that is and, and rare, you know, of course, um, different kinds of alignment, you know, happen in the stars and with the planets at, at different points in time. And um, it does seem like maybe there's a growing appreciation of some of those, you know, the last years, the, the super moons, right? The people that's that concept is something that people are more aware of. People are more attuned maybe to some of the eclipses happening. And I don't think it's just COVID, but I think that did give some people a little bit of sense of more interest perhaps in the worlds around us and the universe around us. And how special we feel these moments are of these comings together and uh, moments of unity and how magical they can really feel and how compelling that is. And so for, for myself, really this, this sort of curiosity around what is that experience internally? What is this idea and what is, what is supported in our, the sense of um, our sense of place and belonging and connection to the universe and alignment with all of that? Um, and where is it? Um, an illusion and where is it a prison right where is the the sense that these moments are more meaningful than other moments uh, that the the alignment and the coherence and the connectedness are better um, or more true, or, or somehow put us in alignment with the deeper truth, where is that also a trap and a way of um, being that can lead us into an unhealthy relationship with where there may be some very powerful truths about alignment and unity and coherence and everything being put together? Where can it overtake our lives, the desire for alignment, the desire for unification? Um, where can it be compulsive and not in tune with reality, not in tune with nature, with the, the fact that these moments of alignment are rare and, and come about usually by forces out of our control and to live life in expectation and guided by the desire for these moments of alignment where can that lead to problems and difficulties? And um, where is the power that comes from it more seductive than the wisdom that might come from something more like attunement? And so I'll, I'll make a distinction in this talk that may not be a real distinction in our language of English language around alignment and attunement. Um, I, I don't know if the dictionary makes as big a distinction as I will, um, but for now I'll offer the sense of alignment as the kind of enforcement of unification, of coordinating uh, with intention, the coming together and the, the bringing together, the, the sense of composure, coherence, and attunement for the sensitivity. Um, for the sensitivity of the relationship of connection or disconnection, the sensitivity to understanding the nature of things rather than trying to control them and trying to control our relationship with them. So, you know, human societies and culture have, have always aimed in different ways for some kind of alignment. And, and, and when I say alignment with the, the weather, 
right? Uh, the, the natural cycles of the seasons or the, the fluctuations of the weather alignment with the um, forces of the stars and interplanetary forces and that degree of sort of nature, you know, on that kind of grander scale, as well as the, the spiritual forces that may be more subtle, less obvious um, of spirit beings, of deities, of um, forces uh, at play in, in the universe, as well as our kind of internal moral and ethical and uh, attention the sense of bringing those things together into unity, into coherence um, for the sake of, you know, for all kinds of practical and spiritual reasons. And of course, for most of humanity, those were not distinct reasons, right? That, that the, the practical was spiritual and the cosmological was the divine and nature, the weather and the winds and the sun and the stars, these were, they were not big distinctions, if any. Uh, between them. And, you know, thank goodness, you know, on many levels of, of course, that sensitivity to when to plant crops and how to irrigate and um, how to deal with winds and how to understand the ways in which the sun and the moon impact all kinds of cycles and um, keep our communities viable. It's, incredible to see some of the ways that various ancient civilizations, cultures had developed the sensitivity and um, channeled that sensitivity into the productive forces, into um, the agricultural forces, and also into empire forces, you know. Um, I had recently watched a very wonderful documentary on the Chaco Canyon and the Chacoan culture of many thousands of years ago where these just incredible structures built and some of them, you know, communities and villages and uh, places of living, others that seem to be more places of gathering around meaningful um, celestial events and spiritual events and ceremony um, this whole range of area there in the southwest, I think Chaco Canyon mostly being in, in New Mexico, but really the kind of expanding, I think, beyond the borders of that in terms of where the influence of the architecture was and, and cultural pieces. And so these just amazing um, sundials and calendars that would mark the equinoxes and the solstices and um, of the sun, but also of the moon. And there was something that, you know, never even considered, <laughs> never mind heard about, that the, the, there are these lunar cycles beyond just the month, right, of uh, 28, 29 days. That, that the moon is also on an 18 year cycle of where we see it at its most northern place of uh, coming up above the horizon and its most southern place of setting or southern place of coming up on the horizon and, and most northern place of setting, the um, also called the standstill, lunar standstills. So these periods of 18 and a half or 18.6 years of these incredible lunar cycles that are also tracked and measured in, in these buildings and in these incredible calendars that were built so that, you know, these light daggers would dip into the spiral on the, I can't remember if it's the equinox or every 18 and a half years, you'd see it come down in this other place where it's marked. Um, just fantastic, incredible amount of attunement and recognition and ability to mark it um, in the landscape and in the architecture, you know, so beautiful, so powerful. And you, it's very easy to feel that sense of what's lost in that culturally where our, none of our architecture is basically oriented in that way, or very little, you know, there, there are some places perhaps where the, in the north, the, the southern face of the, you know, windows are a little 
more present because there's a recognition that you'll get more sun in the winter. Um, but what is it like to live in that kind of alignment and to live in a society that has been constructed in alignment with these forces? And, and then what are the negative sides that might come from that as well? You know, the, the Inca, the um, Aztecs, the Mayans, the Egyptians and Stonehenge and all of the um, New Grange, all those places where, what does it require actually to build a society around those? Well, it requires a lot of power, it requires a lot of centralization where someone is mandating, right? That all these people work to build these places in alignment. Um, and often there are places where there's an identification with the sun or the deities uh, in terms of leadership, in terms of power. And complicated to hold what comes with this dance between attunement to these forces and this alignment and and where is that balance between them? Where's the where is the identification with it? You know, it's 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 believed by some apparently uh, some of the stories passed down to contemporary kind of Puebloan cultures is that the, the Chaco and people that they were too aligned that they, they through their alignment through their incredible kind of um, awareness of these forces developed these superhuman powers. And it was through those powers that led to kind of corruption and um, overextension of their ability. You know, the Inca had, of course, they, their their alignment, their cosmological architecture was also an enforcement of their empire, reminding people at the very outskirts where the center was, right, in Cusco, and that that was the center of the universe, and that the Inca was also the sun, right, this sense of, and then when, when trouble comes, that that kind of power, that kind of consolidation and alignment and uniformity that kind of power ends up being a little fragile. And so we see the ways in which that kind of um, concentration, unification um, has a lot of power to it, but also has a lot of, doesn't have a lot of flexibility, doesn't have a lot of um, nimbleness, uh, ability to attune to changing conditions. It was very easy for all of the people that the Inca were repressing to change sides, you know. When the Spaniards came along, it was very, you know, not sure what was happening in terms of drought with the Chaco and cultures, but could the, could that, the leadership really, um, attune and, and, and be nimble enough to attune to the changes that were happening environmentally. Something that's happening right now. We don't, our world is not oriented towards the sun and the moon, but, or deities in that form, but towards its capital, right? Not to get too hyperbolic around anything, but it's true. It's like our, our the way our society is structured around profit of, of what's gonna make money. And that's what decides where things are built, how they're built. And so for ourselves, as we sit in our meditation practice and we are in this dance of alignment and attunement and where are we trying to um, enforce a cosmology of ourselves through our meditation practice even, you know? Of course, we do that all the time outside of our meditation practice. And part of the idea of the Vipassana practice is to start to undo that. But of course, there are ways that we can use the practice actually to reinforce that, to reinforce our sense of us at the center, that we are the sun, right? We are the center of this world system. Everything 
spinning around us, right? Everything um, coming and going in terms of us here at the center and that we build and construct this uh, self, this empire of self in relationship to that and as a way of aligning towards what we're trying to get and how we're trying to control these forces and how we're trying to use um, that alignment much of the time as a, a way of enforcement, as a way of creating structure and solidity. And of course, there is something amazing that the heart is able to do that. The mind is able um, to build some structure internally around all of this wildness of coming and going, of sensitivity of experience. And yet where are the downsides? Where is the shadow? of this enforcement of alignment and where might be the possibility of attunement, right? A different kind of sensitivity that doesn't deny the importance of observation, right? Of relationship with all of these forces internally and externally, but also isn't just trying to control them or use them to our, um, to fulfill our needs or defend from our places of deepest fear and where might we use the tools of alignment and essentially concentration right of some degree of controlling the attention of um you know managing that to to help in our sensitivity rather than to rebuild uh, what we believe So when we're meditating, we all have had the experience of feeling like perhaps we are in a kind of alignment in our in our posture, in our bodies, in what's happening with the our inner experience, right? There's a sense of coherence of things being in their place. And then as that starts to dissipate for one reason or another, there's a, uh, something catches the attention and there's a, um, an attachment to an idea that that starts to build, or there's an aversion to an idea that starts to build, or there's just boredom. And so the mind is finding fa interest in fantasy, right? And so the mind starts to wander and meander and, um, or sometimes things are just confusing, you know, that the, the way we're perceiving reality is less familiar and starts to feel out of our control and troubling because of that. There is a very reasonable and understandable response to say, this is not, this is quote unquote bad practice. I'm not being mindful. I wanna return to presence. I wanna return to the present moment, right? Uh, the language is often used. And so while of course there's some wisdom in that, there's some care in that, there's some uh, taking in of instructions you've received in that. There is also sometimes worth seeing that what do we mean by presence? Because much of the time, what we might mean is to come back to our sense of ourselves sitting here on this cushion, on this chair, in this room, in this space, to actually come back to who we are. And the pleasant version of that. <laughs> and that we can confuse that experience with the truth, right? That the idea of coming back to the more familiar experience, that that's somehow being more mindful versus, oh, we're coming back to the construction of self. We're coming back as a safety to this version of ourselves that has a concept of, of who we are sitting on this cushion in our bodies, in our room, in our apartment or our home or whatever, right? This sort of bringing ourselves back into this alignment with this um, inner cosmology construction of me. 
and that we think that that means better practice, that that's doing what we're supposed to be doing, sitting here, watching my breath and uh, back in this place. And it's important to consider the ways in which actually being disoriented, being lost, being involved in some other experience that might not be as secure might actually be a more mindful experience, might actually be a more true experience or a less conceptualized experience. And that we don't have to judge when we're very involved in something that might feel sort of chaotic and confusing and overwhelming and disorienting as bad practice, that actually there's an attunement there to the truth at times. Oh, disorientation is happening. Aversion is happening. Doubt is happening. Wanting or not wanting is happening. These things are happening and it, it, it's unpleasant. We don't like the unpleasantness of it. And there's something about the security of the self, the security of the me at the center, the me on this chair, the me at this cushion that feels like a refuge we wanna come back to. And we don't wanna keep you from that. There's no, there's a deep acknowledgement that of all of the places that we might find security and safety and stability in this wildness that might be problematic or, or not the deepest truth. The self is our most common home base. It's the place we're gonna keep coming back to as our sense of deepest security, as unpleasant as it might be at times. And so what does it mean to start to feel like, oh, we can feel less aligned but more attuned. And that our attunement to the truth, our attunement to these fluctuations of the heart and mind and body might be some might be an experience where things are deeply unaligned, right? Where there is no coordination of all of the spheres, where things don't feel all put together, but they're equally valid, equally true. And just because they don't have the sense of coherence or the sense of pleasance, pl pleasure in that same way, um, that doesn't mean that they're not valid or that the practice isn't ultimately designed to make those, our equanimity with those experiences just as important, right? That we're not just going for these pinnacle experiences, just these places of perfect unity between us and the cosmos or us and our inner realms that actually the wildness of existence, the wildness of experience has a place where there might not be as much power, there might not be as much capacity for sure to observe, you know, to observe skillfully, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a very important work happening there and, and a fruitfulness to the vulnerability and the sensitivity to the times where things might feel very deeply unaligned. It is interesting that, you know, one of the, to me, interesting, one of the things that is said to fall away upon a person having um, achieved that, that first insight into Nibbana, into cessation, into the unconditioned, right, of, of what's called the stream entry, um, that, that really gives perspective on all of the arising and passing of samsara of the conditional realm. That So the main thing that's focused on usually often is that doubt gets eradicated, that even a tiny momentary glimpse into the, the falling away of everything, including consciousness, right? There were nothing arises and passes is enough to have this profound reassurance that, that this is true, what the Dhamma is and what the Buddha has taught is true and that liberation is possible. But one of the other things that is said to fall apart at that time is the erroneous belief in rites and rituals. And I think that's very 
it's very moving and very powerful the way in which that can shift in people. Um, and, and how, if you look at all of our human heritage and customs and traditions, most rites and rituals are about alignment, right? Th throughout space and time, throughout human history, it's like most rites and rituals are these, you know, ceremonial functions to align us with a certain intention or a certain divine quality or the universal quality or the planets or whatever. I mean, it's, it is about this power of alignment. And so it's not to say that those are wrong or that people may not continue to engage in rites and rituals. I mean, even in the Buddhist context, there's people may attain full enlightenment and you're, they still, they still go through the sacraments and typical holidays and uh, rituals of, you know, whatever lineage they're part of. But what happens is this idea that it, what drops away is the belief that that's the way to salvation. That through rites and, ritual, rites and rituals, that through alignment, we will actually come to liberate the heart and mind. And that's very profound, right? This understanding that there may be a place for all of that. And we recognize the power that can come from that. And that there are ways of skillfully using that power. But that it might, it doesn't necessarily lead to this attunement with reality, right? Attunement with the truth and the fluctuating truth that's arising and passing in the moment. That sensitivity, that vulnerability, that, that willingness to not know and to not control is much more important in terms of the liberation of heart. And where is our mm, practice exploring? that dance, exploring the places under which, yes, we are going to incline towards some alignment, right? We're going to try to sit in a certain posture. We're going to try to walk in a certain way, but then come to realization that, well, we cannot walk in a certain way. Our bodies at this point are not able to do this certain thing. And to, to feel like, oh, does that mean we're not aligned? If we can't sit up straight on a cushion in our full lotus, posture, does that mean that we don't have enough capacity for alignment with the truth? And it's 100% no, right? 100% no. Whatever the condition of the body, we have the ability for the mind to be attuned to reality, to the true nature of phenomena. Sitting, walking, standing, lying, crouching, kneeling, crunched up, <laughs> bunched up, splayed out, however it is. Very important. And the Buddha says in that sutta that Michelle read from, that this uh, retreat is named from, you know, this idea, everywhere in tune. Now, I don't know all the Pali word that that's translating, but I'll say for this context to, to consider the way that everywhere in tune doesn't necessarily have to mean everywhere aligned, right? That isn't a forcefulness, it's a tenderness. There's a place for, for force. There's a place for intentionality, for assertion of energetic will but to also know that that isn't the answer, that that isn't wisdom in itself, that isn't liberation in itself. And that we don't use it for the wrong reasons, right? Of all of the cosmic architecture, and cosmological architecture, you know, the weather vane is this very elegant and simple, beautiful thing you know, that firm and sensitive enough to be able to move, you know, with the winds, to be directed by wherever the winds are, but still stable, right? Not blown away. And through that, seeing where the winds are coming from, the farmer has a sense of what the 
where they are in the pattern, right? Where they are in the cycle of seasons, where they are in, in the, the rhythm of what might be coming, that given and other information. Will tomorrow be a good day to plant? Will it not be a good day to plant? Will it be a good day to water? If the, if the wind is coming from this direction, what might that mean in terms of storms, in terms of dryness, in terms of what's not yet arisen, what might arise? But there's no farmer that thinks that the weather vane helps them control the wind, right? And so that's what this attunement is more, right? The mindfulness, it's like the sensitivity to what's arisen and what might that mean, how we address it. In the Satipatthana Sutta, the Buddha says around sensual desire, around aversion, around sloth and torpor, restlessness and worry, doubt. If they are present, they know there is doubt in me. If doubt is not present, they know there is no doubt in me. And they know how unarisen doubt can arise and how arisen doubt can be removed and how a future arising of the removed doubt can be prevented. That's sort of a funny translation, but here's another. Where's the... And then there's a positive version of the, you know, the factors of awakening. There is here, if the mindfulness awakening factor is present in them, they know there is a mindfulness awakening factor. If the mindfulness awakening factor is not present, they know there is no mindfulness awakening factor. They know how the unarisen mindfulness awakening factor can arise and how the arisen mindfulness factor can be perfected by development. So you can see there's both of these qualities are in there, right? There's the sensitivity of, is this arisen or is it not arisen? Oh, doubt, oh, aversion, oh, concentration. Oh, genuine interest, right? Mindfulness is present. Tranquility is present. Energy is not present, right? Oh, there's sloth and torpor. Is there interest in them, right? Is there mindfulness of sloth and torpor? No, no, <laughs> right? Like whatever it is, you. it's like, is there, are these things present or not? Is the present moment awareness. But then there's also the reflective part of, oh, well, what leads to the arising of mindfulness? Well, you know, there's all of these things can go into detail, but that even just a sense of like, oh, I can try to bring mindfulness. I can try to see what is it like to arise interest. As we bring interest, there is a natural way in which energy can develop. As energy develops, there's a natural way that, uh, kind of engrossment, joy, rapture can develop, right? When there's that engrossment in what's happening, we can break through the pleasure pain syndrome, right? That, that sense of we're only interested in something that's pleasant and we recoil from that which is painful or we're grasping towards that which is pleasant. This is like through that process and right there around, you know, PT, um, of this kind of, you have the ability to be interested and fascinated and, and on a not just conceptual level, but an engrossed quality of mind with something, even if it's unpleasant. And that leads to a quality of tranquility, right? And, and this dance that can happen there of all, oh, tranquility of the mind leads to tranquility in the body. Tranquility in the body it leads can lead to concentration in the mind, right? Or however that little dance goes. And then concentration can lead to equanimity, right? This deep kind of deepening of the smoothing out along this uh, form of awakening factors of Bojanga. And so there is a place for, oh, and understanding, well, what leads to what through experience, through having gone over this a billion times. Oh, right. This, there's this because of this, and there's this because of that. What might we do to bring a little bit of energy, to bring a little bit more of this, right? So there might be a quality of alignment there, of bringing to bear some of what we know. 
but to be careful that our effort to align, to bring energy, to bring, for example, that's a classic one people have brought up. I'm sleepy, and so I'm going to bring energy. Are we bringing it out of a way that's not attuned, that's actually misaligned with what's happening, right? Out of aversion to sleepiness, out of wanting some other experience. Well, if the wanting is the motivation, if the aversion is the motivation, whatever we do is going to end up having results that increase that, that augment that. And so the sense of, okay, we can bring some energy, but if we were still trying to be attuned to what's happening, oh, we don't want it to come out of aversion, out of craving. So can there be interest in sloth and torpor? Genuine interest, oh boy, what is this like? And, and to allow that interest to be something that builds energy naturally over time. And so, of course, there is this way that the seven factors of awakening can build on each other, that can lead from one to the next. There are also ways in which it's not only linear. There are times where we might have a lot of concentration, but not a lot of energy. Um, we might have a lot of interest, but not a lot of equanimity, right? These things can be sort of out of balance. And do we have to try to always be forcing them into balance? Or can we just be attuned to the truth? Oh, this is, and wherever we are, find interest in them. Find a sense of equanimity with imperfection, with things not being the way we want them to be. Of course, even, uh, you know, fully enlightened beings will get tired. They're not on like 100% energy all the time. They're still human beings. They're still subject to the vicissitudes of life, you know? And so this sense of like, oh, does that mean anything about the quality of liberation of heart because they get tired? Of course not, right? That's, it's irrelevant. It has nothing to do with that. Perhaps tiredness isn't coming as a, unconscious resistance to experience. And so there's this discernment and understanding of all the ranges of, of what is intentional, what is not, what has been uprooted, what hasn't. You know, there's still pain. More pain, right? As we, for many, as we get older, Of course, this has no bearing on the ability of the mind to be free. When you look at the ways in which the seven factors of awakening, you know, that I've mentioned, uh, mindfulness, investigation, uh, energy, rapture, calm, concentration, equanimity, are often put up in contrast with the, um, these five hindrances of craving for sense pleasure, ill will, um, restlessness and worry, sloth and torpor and doubt. And these qualities of mind that feel obstructive and those that feel liberatory. Um, and so of course there are ways in which they can be used, the, the, the awakening factors can be used to address the plague that can feel like a plague, right? Of, of obstruction and hindrance in the heart and mind. But to really get that's very different than there's also qualities of concentration of, of aiming and sustaining the attention um, of, of 
rapture, engrossment, of pleasure that can come from that, and of the uh, unification of mind that can come from that, these jhanic factors of concentration that are very explicitly said to suppress the hindrances, suppress these qualities of mind that are, you know, so difficult for us to work with. And so you can see again in the tradition, there is an acknowledgement of the place where this alignment and concentration and the, the, the power of mind and the forcefulness of mind that's possible does have the ability to repress and to control and to uh, kind of dominate. And that there are times where that may be a skillful action, right? Where there is an ability to kind of override and overcome as a way of kind of getting out from underneath the whirlpool of things. But that those, that suppression is brittle, that is not dependent on wisdom or understanding or insight and will go away. And these things will tend to resurface with a vengeance, right? As an oppressed, <laughs> as any oppressed condition will tend to do, right? That it's like once it starts to crack, it rages out, right? And so the deeper understanding of this tradition is through the method of the seven factors of mindfulness and interest and the energy that builds from that, this willingness to engage with these hindrances, so-called hindrances, with these challenges and difficulties of the mind. The willingness to try to understand them, not just get rid of them, right? That it is through understanding that we unbind, that we untangle, that we come into this deeper attunement. But it's that, and that the liberation that is possible of the total unbinding, these hindrances are all, of course, uh, like other ways of talking about the, the deeper, you know, poisons in the heart of greed, hatred, and delusion. This is from the Ituotaka, a short book of discourses. Bhikkhus, monks, yogis, the Buddha said, one who has not directly known and fully understood conceit, who has not detached their mind from it and abandoned it, is incapable of destroying suffering. But one who has directly known and fully understood conceit, who has detached their mind from it and abandoned it, is capable of destroying suffering. Humankind is possessed by conceit, bound by conceit, and delighted with being. Not fully understanding conceit, they come again to renewal of being. But those who have abandoned conceit and who by destroying conceit are freed have conquered the bondage of conceit and overcome suffering. And there are six or seven suttas that are exactly the same except for instead of conceit, they say greed. Another one, hate, delusion, anger, and contempt. So to really take that in, it's like, one who has di not directly known and fully understood greed cannot abandon it or hatred or delusion or anger or contempt or the awe, right? That's the, the final one is the sense of the awe. It's like anyone who has not fully related to them, fully understood them, fully confronted, explored, and, and profoundly understood them is not capable of abandoning them will always be fighting with them or buying into them, trying to repress them or trying to fulfill them. But it is only through this knowing, this attunement and sensitivity and relationship with them that the mind comes to, as Steve was saying yesterday, of this disenchantment with them, of letting go of the struggle, of not trying to align with them or align against them, uh, of just, oh, understanding. They arise due to certain conditions. They exist when certain conditions are present. They pass away when those conditions are not present. And the deepening of this understanding eliminates the conditions under which they would arise or persist, right? And so there is this sense of, yes, there is an ultimateness of a way of, undoing the tendency for these things, 
but it's only through understanding. And then I think just finally I'll say, if what is the quality that differentiates alignment from attunement? I think that it's mostly this quality of love, of metta, that is perhaps most important in terms of that distinction. Because some degree of mindfulness is needed in both, right? If we're trying to align with certain things, you need to be aware of it. This basic quality of, of awareness, of recognition, of acknowledgement. Now, maybe not the deepest mindfulness, right? Because there are these other things present around control, around manipulation, around gathering of forces, around what might be behind the motivation of that. And that the behind the motivation of this attunement, of this sensitivity, is really this quality, this tenderness of heart, this care, whether it's the, the sense of the worthiness of anger to be cared for, to be connected with, to be in relationship with, the worthiness of shame to be held and felt and touched and experienced and understood. You know, the worthiness of fear, that, that tenderness toward what's arising is a big part of what differentiates this alignment with the attunement from the attunement, right? The sense of this willingness to bear or the compassion quality of heart that can feel this caring for the pain and the suffering of the mind that experiences anger and the suffering that must be at the root of why anger arises. And so it's why we consider metta, loving kindness, um, compassion, appreciative joy, and of course, equanimity to be so fundamental to this process, to be entirely integrated. Of course, yes, you know, as we've said, there are times where you will practice them distinctly, but it is this integration, right, of the sense of, oh, where can the quality of mind and where and, and, and how the sensitivity should be there as much as possible as we're watching the breath or observing sound or observing the body or the mind or external experiences, our relationship to them. That question in terms of, oh, is there metta arisen? Is, is there a tenderness? Is there a gentleness of heart that's arisen? Is, there, is that absent? How has that changed and flavored and, you know, impacted the quality of relationship we're having with what we're trying to observe? If it's very contentious and very intense, is there a place where it's like, oh, maybe inclining a little bit towards tenderness, inclining a little bit towards kindness might bring a little bit more of a, a, a relaxation of that relationship, an opening of that relationship, a willingness to really behold what it is that we're trying to observe rather than control it. Because you always have to ask yourself, we always have to ask ourselves, can we really love something we're trying to control? Can we genuinely be interested in something we're trying to control? Or is the desire to control, to manipulate, even on the most subtle levels, keeping us from the deepest interest, keeping us from the deepest care, love, and capacity of the heart to connect? Something worth exploring. Hmm. Let's just sit for a moment.
So for those of you who have joined us for the Sunday sitting, welcome. We hope you have a good rest of your moments for however long your day lasts from here on out. And uh, for those of you who are uh, part of the retreat, we look forward to seeing you in about 34 minutes for the metta chanting and sitting. Thank you.